Welcome back. Uh, I can't believe that 2023 is over. I really cannot. I think it's been a year that's been very difficult for a lot of us. I personally uh, definitely struggled with how humanity turned out, uh, how we were made to believe what we shouldn't believe, how we were made to accept what humanity should never accept. It's been a tough year, but uh, it's been also a year of reflection uh, and lots of nuggets of wisdom. Uh, I definitely have benefited tremendously from uh, the conversations that I bring to you here on Slow Mo. Uh, it's been uh, a learning experience for me. It's been solace and really uh, a warm hug every week. Uh, I hope you enjoyed those episodes as much as I did. And uh, uh, we thought uh, as a new practice, uh, tell us if you like it, to uh, conclude every year with one or two episodes uh, that sum up uh, some of my favorite uh, conversations uh, and some uh, of your favorite conversations, some uh, of the ones that you uh, rated very highly, uh, you know, so that we can uh, so, sort of summarize the uh, top 10 nuggets of wisdom uh, that we uh, have uh, collected along the way. Uh, I hope you're finding time to reflect uh, on 2023. Uh, as you listen to this podcast, I hope you're finding time uh, to plan for how you will put your best self forward uh, in 2024. I hope uh, that 2024 will come upon us as a year where every child in the world uh, is safe, loved and happy regardless of where they come from and regardless of what their parents stand for. Uh, I give you five of my favorite episodes, uh, five of my favorite conversations uh, on Slow Mo this year. I'd like to start with uh, Nikki Mirgafuri, who grew up in Iran and became uh, a very renowned scientist uh, through her studies in Berkeley and other, uh, and other universities, uh, who came to speak not only about her uh, experience with tough times, uh, but how she manages to slow down and find calm and happiness. Uh, definitely a conversation. Uh, I didn't know Nikki before uh, we, we met here on Slow Mo and definitely a conversation that uh, brought to my mind and to my heart someone uh, who really comes at wisdom from a, a beautiful angle uh, that I think uh, many of you have voted really highly on the podcast. Episode 255, uh, Nikki Mirgafuri personal deepening, personal practice, deepening of personal practice, not just to serve oneself to have more peace and happiness, but for the service of everyone, including oneself. Mm. So it's not this path of, okay, I want to be peaceful. I want to be happy. Um, Yes, that might be immediately what, what is apparent to us. But as we walk the path, as we really um, explore ways to calm the mind, to face our challenges, to face our the habitual patterns of the mind, and or as the Buddha said, greed, hatred, and confusion, and greed being wanting more, 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 more. It's not just money, but wanting more, 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 never being satisfied. Hatred, pushing away, not liking others, people who don't believe in what we believe, they disagree with us, that other person we have challenges with, my coworker, just hatred, push, seeing, seeing all these patterns. And then confusion, the confusion or delusion as it's translated is the root of all suffering because we don't see any better. We don't see not just with our eyes and with our head, but with our hearts, we don't see, we don't really see the impact of our habitually habitual actions on ourselves mm. and on our other people. We don't see that wanting more and more and more impacts ourselves, impacts our own happiness, impacts others, impacts the environment, impacts the earth. So it's that confusion, that delusion of not knowing any better. Not again, not it's not knowing heady, but not seeing with our heart yeah. the impact. Not, not, not relating to any better. Yeah. Yeah, not relating, not having the wisdom, yeah. not having the wisdom to know any better. So, and and this path, even though it might from the from 
the outside might seem like it's, a, it's personal, it's selfish, or this person is going on a retreat and silent retreat for them, so they're withdrawing from the world for a week, for a month, for months. It's actually to to serve not just one serve, but to serve everyone in the way that one shifts and changes, uh, in the way that one one serves. So. So my invitation, what what I found really, and 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 I help support lots of practitioners, both not just on retreats, but also in daily daily teachings. I I, I for example, one thing that I'll share with you is, um, I found teaching about love is as important as teaching about calming the mind, quieting the mind, settling peace, mm. because. Um, and when I say love, it's the practices of kindness. Mm. That have, and not love with attachment. I love you so that you love me back. But the practices of kindness, of friendliness, of goodwill. Let's just say goodwill for ourselves, for others, for neutral people we don't even, people don't even know, with, for people we have difficulty with, to see their humanity, to see their humanity, not condoning the actions. There may be need to, for forgiveness or, or, or making amends, etc. but seeing their humanity, seeing humanity of everything and everyone um, as a way to open our hearts, as, as a way to live more fully, more caringly on this earth to tread lightly so um there's more i can say but but essentially what i found is not just the path the path of happiness i guess i'll say one last thing the path of happiness isn't just um the path, you know the buddha said i i only there's all i only teach suffering and the end of suffering and that sounds kind of negative right mm -hmm. only suffering and the end of suffering and yet the it's you know the end of suffering is is not at the end it's not the end of the path i'm going to do all these practices so that i wake up and not have any suffering at the end it's not like that it's in the every day in our uh, in the way that we relate um um, in the way that we show up, one thing that I like to say is that um, the journey is the destination. The journey is the destination. I've given a whole mm. Dharma talk on that. The journey is the destination. So in this moment, your journey, the, the way we are showing up in this very, very moment is the destination. The destination, yes, there is. But, you know, the destination in some ways we can even see like, well, the we all die. So it was not so much destination. It's just this moment. How are you showing 100%. up in this moment yeah. with kindness, with wisdom, with generosity, with care? How are you showing up in this moment? And can we cultivate that? The next clip I would like to share with you is from my conversation in episode 244 with uh, Dr. Bradley Nelson which by all terms has been one of the most viewed, uh, most popular uh, conversations uh, of the year. Uh, Bradley is the author of the uh, Body Code and the uh, Emotion Code, and his uh, work and method on uh, uh, relating um, our physical form and its symptoms to our emotions and how you can break that code or perhaps uh, rewrite it. Uh, was very eye-opening for me, but also was very, very, very popular among all of you. Uh, so maybe find some time to revisit episode 244, uh, Bradley uh, Nelson, and uh, here is a clip uh, to remind you what that was all about. To me, I think that um, <clears throat> happiness is a state where uh, ideally all of your organs, all of the parts of your body are functioning optimally. None of them are suffering. None of them are in a state of discontentment. They're actually happy too, because it all kind of combines together. And to me, being happy means uh, finding your purpose and living that purpose uh, in your life and, um, and aligning yourself with, um, with the energy that created everything mm. and um and being being in a state i would say of 
a flow as much as you can be. Um, I think that uh, there are a lot of aspects to it. You know, in the in the emotion code book, in the very last chapter, we talk about what you can do to stop yourself from creating new trapped emotions. Yeah. From picking up more emotional baggage. And it, and it goes along with this. You know, one of the things we talk about in the book is, is the idea of forgiveness. Uh, I believe that in order for you to really truly be happy and be at peace, uh, you have to forgive people. You have to forgive the people that have hurt you. And maybe most importantly, you need to forgive yourself. Because, um, you know, and I quote uh, Lewis Smedes, who who said that um, uh, forgiveness is like setting the prisoner free, only to find out that the prisoner was you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, human nature is such that we we withhold forgiveness in an attempt to get even with whoever hurt us. But in reality, it's only blocking our own progress and stopping us from being happy, right? Yeah. From being at peace. So that's one thing. Um, there are some other ideas too. I think that, I think that gratitude is probably our most unutilized superpower. Totally. Um, gr gratitude is so, so, so powerful. And they've done many studies that have shown that, that if you're in a state of, of total gratitude, I mean, your blood chemistry changes, all kinds of things shift for you. And, you know, gratitude is something that we can learn to have and, you know, there's the old saying that we should count our blessings, which sounds almost kind of trite, but, you know, inevitably when you start to do that, when you actually start to make a list of the things that you have that you can be grateful for, um, pretty soon what happens is you start noticing other things that you can be grateful for. They, 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 they tend to pop up more easily. And then you start to shift into this, this different kind of existence where you're, you're, um, you're on a higher level of vibration. Yeah. And then ultimately, I'll tell you what I what I really believe ultimately, and I think it's all about unconditional love. When people die and they go to the other side and they come back, sometimes they do. That's one of the things they talk about. They talk about how they they leave this world and they're in this this other place and they're in this space of unconditional love. There was a video that I saw once. It was an emergency room doctor talking about this. And he said that um, he said that when people die and they flatline, um, only about 15% of the time are they able to bring them back and you know, and revive them and resuscitate them. He said 85% of the time they're, they're gone. He said one day in the ER, they brought three people back. It was very unusual, but what was even more unusual, and this day actually ended up changing his whole life. He said that Every one of these three people said the same thing. Essentially, they said, why did you bring me back? <laughs> exactly. Right? It was so much why fun you there. <laughs> you brought me back here? Yeah. <laughs> but they all basically in, in the same more or less words said that for the first time in their whole life, when they went to the other side, they felt totally accepted. Oh. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. This next conversation was with one of my favorite people on the planet, uh, Elizabeth Day and I are known to hold a very deep uh, admiration and bond with each other. I have been a guest on her podcast three times, uh, her amazing podcast, How to Fail. She has been a guest on mine, uh, I think three times as well. Uh, and uh, she's the best selling author of uh, many books, uh, How to Fail, uh, Philosophy, uh, Magpie, and recently last year, uh, her uh, book, Friendaholic, which uh, she came to discuss uh, with me, interestingly, because uh, while we really, really he hold each other close, uh, as per her definition, and I would definitely agree, we're not best friends. And it's quite an interesting uh, way to understand friendship uh, in terms of if you chose five people to be the closest friends you have in your life, uh, who those would be. Uh, Friendaholic is a definite eye opener. I think Elizabeth always brings her vulnerability uh, to the forefront so that we all learn from it. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation on episode 254 uh, with one of the dearest people I hold uh, in this world, uh, Elizabeth Day. 
a chapter that I wrote in Friendaholic about friendship contracts. Ah. And it was inspired by, yeah. now I'm going to lose you slightly, but it was inspired by the Real Housewives of Atlanta. <laughs> because there is... You lost me completely. Okay. <laughs> there is an iconic scene in that reality TV programme where... How many, how many Real Housewives exist in the world? Like how many... Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know there's a Real Housewives of Dubai now. Oh, I would hate to watch that. I don't think you would, Mo. I think you have a perception of what those shows are that is not grounded in the reality, which is the endless fasc Elizabeth. fascination that we both have for human interaction. Elizabeth, yes. you're my dear, lovely friend. Let's not go there. You can have your cars and I'll have my real house size, okay? <laughs> this is, these are our passions that there'll be no overlap. Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some real housewives have great cars. Anyway. Okay, can we just please not br bring this up? Okay, so you, you, yes. you were inspired. But by... I was inspired because there was a scene in that where the cast, one castmate, Cynthia Bailey, made her then you best friend. You even know her name? Nene Leakes, yes. Oh my God. She made her sign a friendship contract because there had been so much misunderstanding between them. And it was tongue in cheek. But she made Nini sign it and it made me think, do you know what? That's a great idea. I'm not suggesting that everyone goes out and prints out a contract in 12 point times New Roman. But <laughs> I think it's a good idea to think about what might be on that contract. Hmm. When, and what might be on your friendship CV? What do you have to offer as a friend? Being really honest with yourself and very realistic about how much you already have in your diary and what commitments you already have to other people. What do you have to offer as a friend? And what are you looking for in a friendship? So my friendship CV might say, I don't have a lot of time to offer, but I love a voice note. And when I see you, I promise that we'll hit relational depth very quickly. I don't need a, a new best friend. I've already got one of those. And the contract might say, I don't expect anything of you other than to think well of me, for that to be your starting point. And... Um, what else? Like cats. That's not even on there. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that would be the only thing on my contract. But it's actually a good idea to imagine what that might be, because we need to have an understanding of how we show up and what kind of friendship we need and have space for in our lives. This is brilliant. It's, it's, it's brilliant first and foremost, is because we get to think about it even if we don't sign it with others. Exactly. Right? If, if you know what it is that you have in your friendship contract, uh, you, can, you can spot the anomalies when they, sh when they show up and yes. say, no, that's not part of my friendship contract. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then you feel less guilt about potentially leading with love and drawing a friendship to a close because it's gone against your friendship contract. And by the way, when we talk about boundaries. It can sound very clinical, especially in this context. But I also think that there are ways of instituting non-verbal boundaries where you don't need to explain absolutely everything. There are ways of having verbal boundaries where we express our feelings with love. And there are also ways in which we can have porous boundaries in that we redirect our energy. So we concentrate on the good thing that, that person is offering and we take our energy away from the negative. And just as a mental exercise, I found that very helpful with ambivalent friends who I do love, but I have to categorize them in that way. And I know that sometimes if I give too much of my energy, it will make me feel bad about myself. Mm. But if I concentrate on the good things that they bring, that's really helped. It's like tending your flower bed of friendship. Oh. And then there was this incredible uh, conversation about love and romance. I did, of course, many of you would know a very long series on love and romance in the last uh, eight or nine weeks of uh, uh, 2023. And, um, you know, defining love and romance as one of the biggest reasons for unhappiness in our modern world, really loneliness is on top of those reasons. One of my early guests was the amazing, amazing, incredible human being, uh, relationship expert, Matthew Hussey. Uh, Matthew and I met in London 
uh, he had his wonderful uh, fiance at the time, uh, um, Audrey in the room. I had my ex uh, girlfriend, really dear to my heart, uh, Shelley Lewis, uh, in uh, in the room, and then we ended up having a. Uh, mature dudes conversation about love and romance. Uh, you know, Matthew brings so much wisdom, so much kindness, uh, and a no nonsense approach to the topic of love and romance. Uh, I, we became really good friends after. Uh, I wish him all the happiness always. Uh, episode 262, Matthew Hussey. That paradox of choice exists in in every aspect of life from where we want to live to what we want to do Correct. for work to who our friends are and and you're right it the i think that my answer to that would be that so much of happiness lies in stepping outside of the mimetic culture of like what am i being told is good to do or right for me versus what do I actually enjoy based on my kind of DNA? But how do, how do I know that if I haven't tried? Well, and then and to, to, yeah, to that extent, I don't think it is easy for a 22 year old yeah. to know what they want, which is why you shouldn't, if you're serious, date a 22 year old. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that, Something about 22s with you. <laughs> no, but that, I, I believe that because it's, you, they don't. They don't know what they absolutely. What, they haven't cycled through and, and those I, experiences yet. I know fifty-five-year-olds who don't. The, I mean, the, the the question really is: How do I know if I don't like Fifty Shades of Grey if I haven't tried Fifty Shades of Grey? And have I tried, you know, Vicky Cristina Barcelona? And how have I tried, you know, Eat, Pray, Love? And have I tried, you know, there are endless, endless, endless stories yeah. sold to us as romance, and you know, in the back of your mind, you're sort of like. Yeah, I love that steady long-term relationship, but at the same time, I want all of those others at least once in my life. Yes, but I think that we are able to kind of have enough of something to go, that was fun, my but it didn't work. Yeah. Or, you know, it, it was, oh my God, it was so exciting, but it left me feeling horrible afterwards, or it got old. Or, you know, there, I think there are certain things you don't, you know, we don't have to run the experiment on everything to know that it's not right for us. We just have to run That's enough of an key. experiment. That, that is absolutely the key. It's, it's the experiment. And we don't even have to run it at all. We have to have an honest view of it. Like someone who's not selling it to us, but telling us it, really what it was all about, right? Right. And that... The trap that we get into is we we can end up listening to the wrong people. When, Correct. We, you know, we we, we or, or, to, or people selling it the wrong way. Selling it the wrong way. You know, look if you listen to I'm not a I'm not someone who's like some giant proponent of everyone should get married, but you know you'll get married or not get married depending on who you listen to. Mm. If you listen to, um, you know your 55 year old guy friend who has sworn off of ever getting married and is dating as many people as possible and whatever, of course you're not gonna get a great advertisement for marriage. You know, he's defending his position. He's defending the position he's taken. Um, the same is true of your married friends who wanna defend the position they've had of being 20 years in a stale marriage, but they're still going and they're like, you, sh you should get married. And it, yeah, yeah. you're like, well, yeah, but I don't wanna be like you. It's, it's like amazing. It's amazing, <laughs> amazing to be like me. It's really, really, I love it. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you, I think that it's worth, it's worth first getting advice from people who you trust, at the very least, you trust that they've found something that's really working for them. Yeah, I, th I, th I think that, again, you know, I'm going to say mathematics. Again. I think, I think that the answer is to remove layers first, right? Is to tell yourself, I'm not in Monaco, I'm not driving in Monaco. I'm not going to take myself there. I'm in Cannes. I'm going to look at the parties in Cannes. And by the way, you know, if the party is uh, in open air, it's one that matches me. And if it's not, then I'm going to not, right? And, you know, I, I call it the seasons, basically, is to tell yourself it's okay to not know what I want or to, to, to have what I want at this season of my life different than others. Yeah. 
But once you know what you want, that's the only layer you stay in. Um, yeah, because you know yourself, you get to know yourself well enough. And by the way, the part, you know, it doesn't take you going to too many different countries to realize that the parties aren't are, that different. They're exactly the same. You know, okay, now I'm on a beach in Thailand and everyone's getting wasted. Okay, now I'm at Coachella and everyone's getting wasted. It's still, they're still drinking the same booze. Yeah. They're yeah. still human beings. Yeah, and, one, and, and once, on, beings once everyone's wasted, they don't remember where they are anyway. So. Correct. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. There, there's not... We can't, you know, that you don't need to run the experiment a thousand times. To you, in fact, I think that one of the joys of travel is that the more you travel, the more you realize you find the same people everywhere you go. Correct. You know, and and I don't think you need to try every kind of person in the world to know that to some extent you'll find the same people mm. everywhere you go. And the big point I was going to make is that at a certain point, you, when you're experiencing things, and I think people should experience things. I think people should they should try enough to know whether something works or doesn't. A friend of mine, Tanya Rad, a, a radio show host in the US, she said something recently in an interview I did with her that she had listened to a lot of women around her that, you know, she's living in LA, people are dating a lot, a lot of her friends are hooking up a lot, and she was kind of being told, like, you know, do what men do. Go sow your oats. Go do your thing. Like if if men do it, you can do it. You should do it. You and she kept going out there and realizing that when she slept with someone outside of the context of a relationship. And by the way, I have no. I, I I'm not puritanical about that. I don't care mm. whether someone sleep it, as long as you're safe and don't put yourself in a situation that could harm you. If you want to sleep with someone in five minutes, go for it. It doesn't. I don't have a dog in that fight. Mm -hmm. But for her. She realized, I feel horrible mm. every time I do this. Mm. It, I'm around people who keep telling me, like, this is fun. We're in our 20s. We're sleeping around. We're doing this. For her, it wasn't fun. She mm. was doing it. She, was, she wasn't righteously saying, I'll never do that. She was trying it. Mm. And it wasn't working for her. It, it, it didn't feel good. And tuning into that part of ourselves, I think, is the most important thing we can do. Because for her, she then said, well, you know what, I'm going to have a com commitment in my love life to say, unless it's actually in the context of a relationship, I don't want to go there with someone. Yeah, people are different. People are different, but you, you have to connect with what actually makes you happy. It, you know, if I just connect with, with everyone in Los Angeles who's building giant businesses, I would think that the way to happiness is to build the biggest business possible. Yeah. And I... I don't think that's going to make me happy. I don't think that's where happiness lies for me. It's never, it hasn't lied there for me so far. Yeah. Every time I get to a new level, it doesn't change how happy I am. So, yeah. so paying attention to that, and that, that does require some self-trust. And I think that's what a lot of people don't have in their lives, is, is trusting what feels good for me instead of blindly following what someone else has laid out as a formula for a happy life, whether it's marriage or whether it's staying single forever or whether it's being in an open relationship or you, you, you know, know thyself what's actually right for you. And finally for today, there is episode 249, which includes one of my favorite conversations ever on this podcast. Uh, I met Deepak Chopra on, uh, in a speaking engagement. Uh, and we thought, okay, maybe we're both here. Let's record a, a, a quick chat for all of you. Uh, Deepak started talking and I was blown away. I just literally, you listen to the entire episode. I said very little, honestly. I was just blown away by his approach to uh, life uh, consciousness uh, and objective reality and what reality really, really is. Uh, Deepak needs no introduction. His approach to alternative medicine and his countless best-selling books have really, really left a mark on our world today. Uh, episode 249, if you have not heard it, you absolutely uh, should listen to it or watch it on YouTube. Um, here is a, a little bit of it to remind you of that depth of that incredible conversation. Deepak Chopra. All of science and all of our progress just went the wrong way. Yes. We studied the wrong topic. And that's why we are in this crisis of 
an unjust social, economic un- injustice. Because of separation. S- separation. Unsustainable planet. Bad health. No joy. Because of the separate self. Because of the separate self. You know, so when, when they say love is the ultimate truth, maybe there's reason to believe love is the ultimate truth, not as a sentiment, not as um, um, emotion, but as the ultimate truth, that there's one being having infinite experiences. And that love in that case is that sense of belonging or connection between the two, ex- two uh, Take incarnations any experience, of that experience. Track it back to its source. Yeah. Any experience. Sound, touch, sight. There's no sound in the physical world. There's no color in the physical world. Say color, it's photons. Photons are invisible, yes. right? So where is color? Only in consciousness. There is not here. Not here. here. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah, in yeah. consciousness. Yeah. This is all that. is yeah. being processed outside space time. Hmm. All. This this is so like the video game. Yes, it is. It is really like the this video is video play. And the more unpredictable it, it gets, the more creative it gets. Of, of course. So you know th- th- that's another problem with AI. We're trying to make it predictable. Of course not. Okay, impossible. Uh, you're trying yeah. to make it predictable, and in fact, the system is better if it's more predictable, mm. right? But that's not it's consciousness. Not possible, yeah. Consciousness yeah. is unpredictable. So do you think this we're just adding to the fun of the game as as the world becomes? Except we want to win. You see, as long as uh-huh. you have this orientation of winning, then you'll destroy the world. Yeah, you which know? is we should just be, just play. Yeah, just play. play. What, what what would you advise people in those times of uncertainty? I mean, it it is. I had a prayer I used to teach my children mm-hmm. when they were growing up. Whatever the mystery of the universe is, Allah, God, whatever, please make today more unpredictable than yesterday. More unpredictable? Yes, because if you start with that assumption, nothing goes wrong. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and by the way, everything yeah. is unpredictable. This is, okay, this is only the past is predictable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, otherwise, everything is unknown. It, it, it is the design of physics. Entropy is the idea that everything will break down. Correct. Basically, this is, you know, we're just following the laws that were set in motion at the beginning. That's it. Entropy is the basis of creativity. Deepak, I have um, found your humbleness uh, quite humbling for me. Uh, it is... There's no choice when you know that the more you know, the less you know. You know, Socrates said, the only thing I know is I don't know. Because even what we call empirical facts, you know, are species-specific modes of knowing and experience. You say it's actually every empirical fact is a magical lie. Every experience (laughs) is a magical lie. Your experience tells you the earth is flat. Nobody believes that anymore. Your experience tells me that we are sitting on ground that is stationary. It's spinning at dizzying speeds and hurtling through space. There's thousands of miles an hour. Your experience tells you things are solid. They're proportionately as void as intergalactic space. So whatever you measure as empirical fact is a magical lie. Now, it works because we can create technology out of it. Yeah. So we think, wow. We you create know, more is, lies on yeah? top of it. Yeah. More magical lies. More really. magical lies. Mm-hmm. So you start with a magical lie. And, you know, when you say we're creating VR, we are already in a VR. We are already in a VR. I mean, yeah. in, the in body a, mind is part of the VR. In, in a, in a, you know, in one of my favorite spiritual teachings is the is how the Sufis will say to die before you die. That's it. Jalaluddin Rumi. God's language is silence. Everything else poor translation. When you are silent, it reveals itself to you. This has been. Um, an extreme urge within me for the last few years to, to constantly disappear 40 days at a time. I, I do it regularly. It Not is, 40 days, I do a couple of weeks at a time. Yeah, I think this year I'm going to be forced to do weeks instead of... I, I, I have to say, when, whenever I, I've completed 40 days, 
the last week was so insightful. It was truly the feeling of living. I, I, I will say it was the only times where I would truly feel um, that I managed to connect to to myself, to the source, to others, right? And it's so funny because we think that I connect better to others when I hold my phone and I text them or I call them or I see them. Or It's so interesting how so deep... solitude is not the same thing as loneliness. Of course not. Solitude, you connect with everything. Loneliness, you disconnect even with yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so when, you, when you say silence... Is the language. That's uh, Jalaluddin Rumi. He says, God's language is silence. Everything else is poetry. So what, what is found in silence? Infinite possibilities, infinite creativity, self-regulation, spontaneous evolution, intuition, insight, imagination, creativity, transcendence, all in silence. And, and, and we, humanity, once again, are moving almost the exact opposite yeah, way all the time. we're more connected but more lonely at the same time. Yeah. So we spend our time more and more in the noise. In the noise also, I would say we've sacrificed ourselves for our selfie. <laughs> As a human <laughs> race. <laughs> yeah. So he's constantly looking for likes, yeah. dislikes, yeah, yeah, validation. Yeah. And it lives in fear. The selfie lives in fear. I was talking to one of my very dear friends, very, very, very successful, millions of followers. Uh, and, and, you know, and we were discussing again about artificial intelligence and how we have become slaves to the machine. So we're not actually looking for the likes of humans. We're not looking for humans to say, I like what you said. No. We're looking for the algorithm <laughs> to favor us enough. In fact, people buy those algorithms, yes. right? It's crazy. And, and somehow, no more do we actually value that human connection that someone actually looked at something I said and said, yeah, that's nice. Thank you, Mo. We're more interested in how many of them in an aggregate have somehow said like so that the number on the algorithm looks good. Such a disconnection from the reality of who we are. Yeah, we are, yeah. We are fictional characters in a collective dreamscape. I would talk to you forever. Like, if you allow me, I would literally shadow you just to listen to you speak. But, uh, but, but, you know, I, I find that my favorite podcasts, I normally finish quicker because I think our listeners need to go and listen back to it. Yes, I agree. So, so if, I, if, I were, if I were to ask my teacher to give me one advice. You have a choice, either resist or flow. That's it. Resistance is this, matter. Flow is the vast expanse of consciousness yeah. in which every experience is a ripple. It comes, it goes. But only that infinite, spaceless, timeless, boundless, irreducible, fundamental, incomprehensible mystery remains. So I would say, you can't solve the mystery, but you can surrender to the mystery. I forever am grateful that you exist. Thank I am you. truly and honestly, uh, not, you don't speak to my mind, even though you do. You don't speak to my heart, even though you so deeply resonate. But somehow being in your presence oh, you're very kind. makes me feel that oneness. That, that though clearly we're at different stages, there is such a unity between you and everyone I have seen you around. Well, there's a memory of that unity, okay? No child is ever surprised that they exist. They just see this world, they're they wondrous. Like, yeah, I know this. <laughs> and then here it is. So, you know, if you're not perpetually surprised by your existence, then it's not <laughs> worth it. <laughs> yes, the awe your, is, the, your, is the experience. That you exist should be a perpetual surprise. You know, there's no explanation. Who yeah. said Mo should be here or Deepak should be here? But here we are. Here we are. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, but for all the time that you have given me in 2023. It's been a tough year. Uh, I hope that I and my guests have managed to bring 
a bit of wisdom, uh, a bit of calm and peace, and a little bit of a slow time for you through the year. Uh, I use this time of the year to reflect and sit back and think about what happened in the year before, what's going to happen, hopefully, uh, and what I wish to see happening next year. Uh, I wish all of you all the happiness. I wish you a lot of calm and peace. Uh, and I hope that through this time, you too can find a little bit of time to slow down and reflect. I love you all for listening, and I will see you next time. <laughs>